Hi, and welcome to the Future of Work podcast, hosted by me, Luca Birsa, the co-founder of Joan. Our company is at the forefront of assisting thousands of businesses around the globe in navigating the complexities of hybrid work environment. Celebrated for our innovation, we're proud to be recognized as the leading solution by G2 Crowd, thanks to our pioneering approach to integrating the latest trends in workplace dynamics and productivity. In this podcast, we delve into the evolving landscape of the modern workplace, engaging with thought leaders to uncover insights on tomorrow's working world. Kicking off our series, we are marking a significant milestone. This is the first anniversary of the successful integration of the four-day work week at Joan. And for this occasion, we're honored to have Dr. Dale Willehan join us for this discussion. As the CEO of the four-day week global and a distinguished behavioral scientist, Dale is at the cutting edge of advising companies on adopting this transformative work model. Sit back and enjoy the insights we've gathered for you on the show. Uh, with us, we have Dr. Dale Willehan, uh, CEO, uh, CEO of Four Day Week Global, um, who has background in behavior psych- psychology and uh, as a part of his daily work, he focuses on helping companies implement four day work week. So he's also been a part of a, uh, of a few studies, helps some companies get across the starting line. Um, so uh, Dale, would you mind telling us a bit more about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me on. So uh, as you said, Luca, my background originally is actually in academia. Um, well, actually predating that, I actually originally trained in physiotherapy. And so I've always been quite interested in health and well-being of people um, and being able to use interventions that could try and improve that. So physio wasn't uh, my calling. So I went into academia and specialized in behavioral science, looking at what are the different reasons why people behave the way that they do. And so many different disciplines of thought, like neuroscience and psychology and anthropology, have all been trying to answer these questions for a long time. As a behavioral scientist, my view is to try and bring all of those schools of thought together and give a, a more holistic answer. And the four day week as a conversation was emerging during my PhD. And all of the research was pointing towards in the space of well being in the workplace, we need to start de- designing interventions that are less focused on the individual and more focused on addressing some of the organizational structures that are stopping people from working. And so intrigued by the concept of the four day week, I uh, volunteered and eventually became the CEO of the organization. And what we do is we work with organizations across the globe in providing a proof of concept as to how working less hours uh, actually is good for not just people, but for businesses and for society through the mantra of work smarter, not longer. So. During all of the, this time, um, how many companies you've spoken to uh, or helped on this path? Well, I've definitely spoken to uh, thousands. Um, we have about 350 companies that we have actively supported over the last few years, but they're true. Um, attending you know, sessions with their leadership team or supporting them through a six month pilot or using some of our other resources like our foundation program or our Invincer Boss. Um, kind of resources. So we have definitely seen this exponential rise in interest in the four day week over the last 12 months, in many ways being driven by, I think, a change in the psychology of the worker since the pandemic. And secondly, leaders now facing a global mental health crisis in their workforce that they are really struggling to understand how to improve. Um, and four day week seems to be an intervention that can support that. Why do you feel that, why do you think that there's like a global crisis of uh, order help um, worldwide? Do you have any data that supports that? Yeah, I mean, the World Health Organization, all the data is suggesting that this world is becoming more isolated, more lonely, uh, more stressed out than ever before. 
And I think what's driving that is we are cup overflowing with information and incapable of orderly processing along with that. Um, there is so much societal pressure now as well in order to, you know, one of our fundamental human needs that we strive for is security. And in today's world, finding that security, whether it's through housing or through geopolitical you know, security, is becoming increasingly difficult. I suppose in a previously non-connected digital world, we were probably ignorant to so much um, that was probably better for us psychologically, mm. whereas now we need to figure out strategies for the first time ever to detach ourselves from reality in order to protect ourselves. And I think that's really what is going to be the, f- the key intervention in the future mm. to try and improve uh, the mental health of our societies. Uh, I guess all the global conflict and all the things that are going on in this crazy world is for sure not helping us uh, to live a calmer uh, life, right? Uh, so uh, we've been, we've mentioned for the work week a couple of times right now. I mean, it's the podcast is all about that and we haven't even defined that. So how do you define for the work week? Yeah, it's a really good question because the, the term for the work week is nearly the umbrella term for many different work practices. Um, what we advocate for in for daily global is reduce working hours. So we use a principle called 180-100, which is 100% pay, 80% time for 100% output. And that was founded off an initial trial done by the founders of the company, which said that we can actually reduce worker time give them the same amount of money, but expect the same results. And that is what has become the proof of concept that has been validated now in loads of other companies across the globe. The other version of a four day week that you see in conversation is compressed working hours, which is a traditional work week compressed into a shorter time span. So 40 hours compressed into four days as opposed to five days, Mm -hmm. for example. We don't advocate for that approach because you're not actually addressing any of the changes that are needed in your organization uh, in the first place. And yes, you might be giving them an additional day of free time, but you are just putting a rubber or a, a plaster over what is essentially an organizational gaping wound. Um, so you're not going to actually address the systemic productivity issues that might exist mm-hmm. simply compressing working hours. I mean, I think you bring up a really good point here. Um, when we started in, uh, at Joe, we started off with this idea that four day work week is just kind of cutting one day out of the calendar. And one year in, I think this is as far as for, from the truth as possible. So it's for sure it's not like that. And I fully agree here with you. It's uh, four day, four four day work week for us is basically the ultimate flexibility in terms of when you do your work. As and basically, instead of looking at hours spent, looking at what you've achieved, right? So um, there is no need for you to, you know, to fake your work or like have this culture of being present in the, in the workplace just so that uh, you're perceived as doing really hard work. And I fully agree with, with the notion that it requires serious organizational change uh, if you want to achieve that. And I guess we're going to talk about the challenges a bit later on. Yeah, as well. but on that, I suppose, one of the main questions we pose to organizations is why a five day week? You know, what, what are your underlying assumptions about your work that mean that 40 hours or whatever your five day week is, is the optimum amount of time for you to do the amount of work that you're doing. And we know that issues of presenteeism exist within the workplace. So why don't we just get rid of that time? If we know that we can actually get our profile of work done by a certain amount of time in the week, then let that just be that. Um, I always liken the idea that we're 
training workers to be more like elite performers as opposed to you know cogs in a machine who consist of output because fundamentally humans go through ebbs and flow in energy unlike a machine so we need to harness our understanding of how to keep people motivated in their work and having them in work not doing work is one of the main hijackers to that motivation in the first place yeah but you know how it is if people are able to do the same amount of work in let's say four days that means that they're slacking you know that means that they should work even harder uh would you agree with that uh, statement well i think that the reality is that a lot of the workforce is not working to the best of its ability um in fact leaders and management often are extremely risk averse to making decisions so there's meetings about meetings about meetings instead of actually just doing competent work and making a decision there and then they've created three or four additional hours of workload for themselves and as a result probably created six or seven additional work hours for staff below them in, in kind of field research so i i challenge the you know challenge that assumption that um people are slacking off people are simply operating within the system that's not working what what we've seen in practice i think it um it fully aligns with what you just said is that there is a system in place and unless you decide that you're going to change that and then change how and you really work on that uh nothing will yes. change obviously right we'll stay everything will stay the same um and uh, i guess the first step is then to start talking about how do we move from zero to one right how do we go one step forward and uh, for us you know it was like we, we we're a company that works on workplace solutions so we do technology for the workplace we help workers survive their work days uh and uh, we need to try out new things right um i like to think that we're very forward thinking and uh, i remember two years ago or, or almost two years ago i've seen some studies that were saying like four day work week best thing ever everybody should do it and i was like this is total bs no way that it works as 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 advertised but being the company that we are uh we said okay we need to at least try out right and we've selected a team um that has really good performance metrics so we were able to measure the output you know versus the hours done okay. and we said okay let's try it out on this this team and let's let's learn and i think that was around that time we also reached out to you guys for some advice we really scanned what's going on in the in the field read a lot of studies that there's a lot of materials uh, are, uh, uh, a lot of material is already out there so um, and we started going through phases right of implementation but that's our experience how do you see that uh with others how do companies usually get started what would be your recommendation how to get started somebody that's that's going to listen to to our podcast yeah well i suppose the first thing is actually as a leader reading up on what 40 week is and it is um you know people think that the 40 week is simply something to improve employee well-being and that is certainly a very important part of the intervention whether that be for altruistic reasons or for business reasons because once your staff are actually happy and healthy they perform better in work um, that's just what all of the signs out there shows us when your workforce is unmotivated they're disengaged which means lower levels of productivity and output so there is a financial uh you know work in trying to understand how to make your staff happier and healthier and so you should begin to follow the evidence base that is showing how to do that you know organizations are investing large amounts of money at the moment in the in mental health programs um 
yoga, at lunch, all of these, you know, window shopping wellness interventions that are simply not moving the dial and actually probably creating a worse culture towards mental health in the workplace because it's further stigmatizing the issue. Um, for 14 week organizations, what they do is they, they come in with that philosophy. They understand, okay, this is an experiment. This means we're going to have to change our mindset over the next few months and that we are going to get this right in the first place. I think business leaders really like the term human resource transformation in how they approach this because we spend a lot of money on technology and finance transformation, but we do very little to understand how to change and better leverage our human resource. So that's a nice mindset for business leaders that can help them realize, okay, what we're trying to do here is not just reduce working hours, but it's the transformation that's required within people in order to make that a success uh, that's going to be critical to the longevity of the business. So what you see organizations in the run-up for preparing for a four-day week trial, they first have to ask the question of themselves, what is good in our staff? What does that look like? Um, and they often are very poor at being able to find that, particularly in roles where maybe KPIs haven't been as clear. It's hard to quantify output to the same level as, as a sales team or something like that. And that brings through a whole kind of part of process for the business in understanding what are the roles and responsibilities of people and how are we going to evaluate those roles going forward, um, which is really good for them. Then they actually embark on understanding, well, this is what people, these people need to do how are they currently performing within the system? What changes can we make within the work week and within our processes and our technology and our culture to necessitate them being able to achieve these key, key KPIs only while also reducing their working hours successfully? And that's where you see organizations doing quick wins like reducing meeting times or getting rid of meetings as much as possible, one of the biggest hijackers of our time. Um, using technology as a way to actually minimize disruption of work as opposed to what it currently does is create more work for us in many instances. Being much more deliberate about communication and decision making. So actually no meetings about meetings about meetings. Um, let's have a meeting, let's have all the information ready, let's make a decision, you know, as quick as possible. And ultimately then, um, by the Thursday, the individual in their workplace should have had sufficient time to do their individual tasks by themselves, but also to do the team tasks that maybe they are they're part of as well. So the work week is restructured in a way for the calendar to block out time where they have deep individual flow work and then time allocated for team work as well. So you're able to create a bit more stability uh, in the work week, uh, you know, across across the pilot um organizations typically go through like any change intervention the initial high this is amazing we're all going to be working less to oh god what have we got ourselves into um and that's a really important phase for them to be in is actually realizing the significant amount of change that needs to be required in order to make this work and getting the collective buy-in of everyone, not just management, to try and understand those and resolve those systemic, cultural and process-based issues that are currently impeding people from working less. So you get this kind of not just people working on their own work, but actually people working towards making the organization a better place as well. Ultimately, then they come out the other end, you know, realizing that, okay, this works for us now. We have this version of a four-day week and having a more growth mindset to say this works for us now maybe in a few months time we might need a different version of a four-day week or we you know this team has this version of a four-day week and this team you know has a completely different version and that's okay um because we have over the last few months focused a lot on building team collaboration and communication which didn't exist before and so they're the changes that we see happening when organizations kind of embark on this journey listening to you uh i understand that even my own preconceptions about how others, uh, how what's the typical experience versus what was our experience, 
it's totally different. And I'm guessing that a typical experience is not that different to what we've seen, right? It's, it's exactly like you said, we started with, with thinking about, with, with finding a candidate team for, for implementation. We said, okay, let's really read up on, on everything that's out there in the field. We, we started measuring stuff in the team. We had really strong metrics before, like KPIs in terms of performance um, that we could look at before, middle, and after the trial. Uh, and like stuff, stuff that you said, there is going to be so many process based issues that will arise to the point that we kind of created the seven rules of four day work week. And those are kind of our own internal rules in terms, you know, what happens with, with holidays, what happens with this, what happens with, with that. And I think that you're totally, totally right. Or I fully agree with, with this statement that it's all about the culture, right? Even having this open culture, there, there's just one team trying, for instance, for us, it was like 20%, 30% of company trying this out. How will the other teams perceive this? Like, hey, these guys are slacking, you know, they're, they're working four days a week and whatnot. So, uh, but in, in the end, I think the culture really pulled us through. So, yeah, well, look, and culture is one of those things where I always like the analogy that you might have five men blindfolded touching an elephant at different sides, and they'll all think that it's something different. And only when you actually bring those five, you know, you, you remove the blindfold and all five men can actually see the culture in its whole. That's what the culture of the organization is. So operations you know, sales, marketing, they all have their own subcultures and how you bring them all together under one umbrella uh, ultimately comes down to the leadership style of, you know, of, of their teams, but also of the organization. I always like to use the analogy before they week as like leading a horse to water. So you can, you know, lead the horse to water. I, you can provide the policies, you can write the rules, you can do all of that sort of thing. That's not going to be enough. You then need, you know, people around or a tribe of horses drinking water to encourage that horse to want to drink water as well. So you're creating the cultural norm that it's actually, we don't log in on Fridays. We, we do these little practices on the Thursday evening to make sure that we're all aligned and that, you know, our week's tasks are done. We meet in culture is 10 minutes versus 50 minutes, you know, no agendas before meetings, those sort of new cultural norms or ways of working. But ultimately the horse has to drink the water themselves. So there's three elements to behavior change, the organizational permission, the leadership and culture, cultural enablement, but ultimately trying to find that what's in it for me uh, as the individual. And I think that's why four day week is so powerful is because it's a psychological contract being established between the employer and the employee, which says, I will give you the best version of myself in work in return for more time off mm -hmm. for me to do the things outside of work that I find, you know, more enjoyable or as enjoyable. And that's where people in their time off say that they are reconnecting with family, you know, reconnecting in local communities, doing life at me and um, reporting lower levels of stress, being more physically active, sleeping more, all of those sort of things. And I think that's where you're able to build this level of intrinsic motivation within people to say, this is really working for me. And therefore I want to continue to put my best foot forward in order to make sure that this is a sustainable intervention, not just for me, but for this organization. You know, when we started, we, let's say my biggest worry was how this will impact our culture. Or is, uh, will people see this as a friction point internally, right? Um, and because I guess when you go into this, this type of experiment, it's always like, what it dispels, right? And I think we need to talk about that as well. What, what's kind of the measure of, of success? Mm -hmm. Um, and what's even perceived as failure. And I must say that today I'm looking at this topic totally different than at when, when we were starting off. Um, so 
before we jump to that, I'd just like to ask you one kind of specific question for for networking. Uh, even internally, we see different approaches, right? Some some uh, teams go all in. Some kind of try to ease in. What's what's your take on on what would be the best approach to to for this to to succeed? Yeah. So based on the data that we have available at the moment, and I suppose it's worth noting as well that we conduct the trials, but they're actually independently evaluated by academics. So we don't influence the findings. Uh, we are simply able to provide data set for the academics to evaluate. A majority of companies who've been involved in trials today in small and medium enterprises. So they've actually been able to have the flexibility uh, to be creative and innovative with their human resource and probably go all in with their, you know, with their resources. Um, so we started working with some large organizations in the last month or the last year as well. And they've kind of got slightly different in the sense that they might pick a unit where they know this might work well and want to prove that it can work well. Some might try to do a cross section of, of a few different departments, some organ some parts where they know it will work well, some where maybe they expect some resistance, some where the idea before they leave might never seem to work like a frontline work and try and understand those different ways of which we can apply a four-day week. So the simple answer is there is no right way. Uh, there's only the right way for your organization. I think a, a necessary indicator is understanding the change readiness of your, your leadership to actually embark on this journey. So if you are a team that has a culture of, you know, failing fast, fail quickly and iterate and realize power of failure as a means to learning, um, then I think you are probably going to go more all in with this approach. Whereas if you are a very risk averse organization with strong bureaucratic structures of decision making, then it probably will be only palatable to leadership that you trial this in a smaller pocket uh, first. So that would have been our experience with companies to date. In terms of easing in or in terms of um... Uh, in terms of deploying this across the teams, you, you said it really depends from the culture of experimentation or are you risk averse or not risk averse. For us, it was a bit different. We said we're not at risk averse, but we need our business to be to work, right? We don't have millions in the bank that we can just freely invest in this. It, 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 this cannot be an altruistic project for us. It needs to be sound business decision, right? Uh, and we picked a team. That's why we we selected a smaller team to implement this because we we knew that we're gonna be able to measure the results and not just like you know the personal well being ones which you do through surveys and whatnot, uh, but also like the macro, the objective, how much work has been done, did this change, uh, and uh, we really needed to have a really clear answer. Okay, in this, the team that this, it, it was the the development team, in the development team, will we see a drop in, in performance? And my, my, my view being a skeptic and all was that after we see the drop in performance, what, what do we do next, right? Uh, so I think this is a good segue to talk about uh, results, right? Because for us, the results were good. I, I mean, it's it's really funny because sometimes I, I talk to people in the industry and I talk talk about four day work week and I tell them, yeah, we work just four days, and everybody's but how do you compensate for the lack of the output, right? And I say I always ask what lack of output. It's insane because people eat in our own internal be benchmark, not academic ones, but the ones that are really measure our own output, we've shown that people spend less time working to output more. So at the end of the week, even though people typically work eight, work eight hours less, they do more work than before. The other, they output more and um, talking to the employees and uh, I'm sure you're going to back that up with, with 
practical results from your studies is that uh, it's an insane perk for the employees, right? It's you no know, me mental health, uh, well-being. It's all of this, uh, all of these, let's say, factors, right? Um, um, and from from a business perspective, uh, like like I said, I mean, there's so much output. Um, so it's really, really good for business as well. Plus we get what we call our reserve capacity. So with our implementation, we said, okay, guys, you're going to work four days a week. You have one day, one, one day per week off. You can pick which day you can coordinate this internally. It, it, you can be flexible with that. But generally speaking, there's one week that one day per week that we don't bother you and you need to coordinate with the rest of the teams. So this, this works for the organization, obviously, but you know, like in every business, sometimes there's, there's like higher force, right? Something really goes wrong. And, um, in, like from a systems theory, from our perspective, this was, this usually was, uh, now something w went wrong. Everybody's working to their max. Where do we get the additional capacity? There's no capacity to spare here. Perhaps every couple of months, people, there's something, some special event and people say, okay, hey, we're getting full pay for five days a week. Like, like we're working five days a week. We're actually working four days a week. It's not a problem, Luca. We need to work for this Friday just so that we as a team, we achieve something, right? And that's, that's one of the, the, the big perks. And the final was all, obviously it's, you know, it's, it's hiring, right? Uh, it's a very competitive wor world in terms of talent. So it's a it's an insane perk that you can offer to to a future employee, right? Um, so how does that compare to like a typical experience that you've seen in the companies uh, that implemented four day work week? Yeah, by and large, quite similar. Um... What I think is happening is that all we are doing is showing that what science has been saying for a long time actually works in practical terms. So when you actually marry human psychology and physiology to effort uh, within the workplace, you know, you will get a, a, a peak in return of investment. And, you know, you want, you want people a small bit stressed so that they're working at peak performance, but you don't want them so stressed that actually their performance wanes. And what we're doing is tipping the balance back to getting them up at that peak of performance. Um, the reality is that the world of work now is highly cognitive and emotional as opposed to very physical. I mean, a traditional five day work week came from a, a workforce that was very physically laborious and repetitive. Whereas now we have to constantly change our behaviors, change our communications, depending on clients, all of that sort of stuff. And the reality is that that is us much quicker than doing repetitive physical work. Um, so that's where you see issues of burnout and stress starting to rise exponentially within our workforce is because we're doing working hours equivalent of an industrial labor worker as opposed to, you know, a cognitive uh, worker, which is what we majority of us are now. And what you see in organizations is that you see a significant reduction in individual levels of stress coupled with an increased level of physical activity and improvement in sleep, which leads to a positive transfer then to individuals' performance in their work. So they're able to, as you say, not just do five days work in four days, but often do more than five days work in four days. So they're actually able to, because they're more rested, they're actually able to think a little bit more laterally and problem solve in a much more you know, innovative way than maybe the tunnel vision way of working that they were constantly mm -hmm. focused on. Mm -hmm. um, at the team level, then I think what you find is there is this level of access and collaboration as a resource that was maybe not previously tapped into before. And it's because organizations constantly tell themselves the lie that they're collaborating well, um, but actually all they're just doing is talking a lot to each other. Um, so there's never a very direct focus on understanding the team as a unit and how to make the team unit work better to try and reduce workload and working time. Um, and then lastly, I suppose you see that ripple into organizational performance. So 
improvement in revenue scores have been found by you know a majority of companies reporting on revenue um which is you know a hugely positive finding for that's been consistently replicated now across many of the pilot studies um I agree with you. I was skeptical of the findings as well. I am an academic before being a CEO. So I, I value the objectivity of knowledge, you know, and understanding something and whether it's reality or not, or whether it's a market tool. Um, and I can say, you know, this is something that works. Uh, it's not without its challenges, but it is a worthwhile challenge to engage on because it can lead to such positive effects um, for for everyone involved. I mean, you you started talking about challenges, right? So we can we might as well check segue into that because, like, the experiences part and the, how this went for us, it's totally on par with what you're saying, right? Um, all the metrics he proved. Um, so for us, actually, going for forty work week was it's good business, right? It's not just something that we want to do because we're altruistic, uh, but it actually aligns with what we want to do uh, in terms of the business performance. And we, if we look at our per business performance in the past year, we've grown considerably. So not sure that this is kind of a serious problem for us or uh, for a company. Yeah. It's, it's I, I do believe with the last statement the most, like where the challenges start is in, with the fact that or they work week forces companies to accept certain realities about their work some stuff that they're not willing to uh, admit that perhaps they're overly bureaucratic that perhaps they're really slow in implementing stuff they that they, they really don't know what they their, their workforce is actually doing you know these are <laughs> It's a tough question for somebody who's used to managing people by seeing them in the office, typing them, uh, typing them on, on their computers and saying, okay, yes, they're working. And now saying, guys, you're going to work one day less. And does that, what does that make me as a manager? You know, am I bad? Did people slack off previously because I wasn't paying enough attention? So many questions arise, right? Yeah. Uh, and I bet it's, um, uh... I might actually pose a question to you, Luca, like, I'd be interested to know, uh, how did you go from being, what were the learnings that brought you from being a skeptic to now being someone that embraces? What did you have to change within your own thoughts and perceptions and biases? So, so yeah. for me, I'm really, uh, evidence-based, right? I need to see I believe it when I see it, right? And you know, it's 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 really the biggest aha moment, aha moment for me was not when the first thing implemented, which was very prone to experimentation. But my perception of the team was that, sure, I mean the the performance could be, you know, perhaps could be better, could be worse. Perhaps we couldn't see it right, uh, clearly through that. But then. We've, uh, uh, we've asked the second manager to implement it. And this guy is like the most performance oriented person in the world. I know like there's like not a second that's not unaccounted for in his workday or in his team. So super efficient, really needs, he really needs, uh, things to, to happen. And he went all in, he said, we're going to just kill one day and see what happens. And he said after like the experiment, there's no difference. The same out. And then, you know, coupled with all the bonuses, it's, it's, it's such a revelation that right now it's more about, for me, it's, I really believe that this is the way we should go forward. And we're not changing this unless there is something, some cultural, challenge in terms of, you know, friction internal, something like that, that, that deteriorates, that deteriorates the relations in the company. That would be kind of, you know, we need to stop this. Um, so it's all about addressing the challenges, right? How do we get everybody on the same page? Because 
even I am the co-founder, I'm the owner, I'm the CTO. So lots of pull in the, the organization, obviously, right? Uh, but still, even with, with my, my perception and the CEO's perception, the other co-founder's perception, we really want to have this happen. We still see friction from leaders themselves because, you know, if you're building a performance or oriented organization, you're afraid of doing things not that would impact your performance. And we have proofs in the organization that this works and still leads are sometimes reluctant to move over. And the biggest challenge here, I think it's like what you said previously, you need to have clear metrics, you need to have clear KPIs, you need to have a clear understanding of what people are doing. If you lack that, that's the biggest hurdle for us. And um, the teams that, that lack that or that are super small, you know, that's what we need to address. <clears throat> how, does yeah. that, how does that align with, with, with what you've seen? Yeah, yeah. Similar. Um, I think it's important to go over the philosophy of mine that this is an experiment and that, yeah, this might not be, this is not going to solve all the problems, um, but it will raise them up to the surface for you to actually see them visibly for the first time. Mm. Um, those issues of culture and leadership, which are often talked about in pockets of the organization, but never put out in the open and actually understood and understand what's causing issues of poor culture or poor process or poor technology use, you know, or they make forces them to rise the top and to actually identify solutions for them, uh, which I think creates that culture of growth mindset that yes, this is how things always have been, but that's not the mindset that we're going into going forward. Organizations have invested, you know, so much time and energy over the last 40 to 50 years on efficiency, you know, lean six sigma, agile ways of working, all of these sort of things. And applying these methodologies on a workforce that is simply not interested. Um, why would I, as a worker who feels overburdened with work, well, let me rephrase feels overburdened with inefficient work, uh, want to try and address that issue, but all I know when we're trying to be guaranteed is more work, more of the same. Mm -hmm. In a four day week, you're changing the mindset to say, let's use these tools to become more efficient. But in return, we're not gifting you more work, we're gifting you more time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what fundamentally is changing within organizations. I think leaders, are critical in their mindset in order to embed that philosophy within teams and if that doesn't happen i think that's where we see failures in the 40 a week trial simply implementing this and expecting everything to go uh, amazing from day one is an extremely naive approach on this and uh, this requires dedication it requires um, courageous leadership and leadership at all levels of organization in order to make it work. And I think when you see that happen, you see the benefits of it. It's, it's funny that you mentioned this modern, let's say Kanban agile approaches, um, and this perception of where, where the productivity is going, what, what is being, is it being used for? Right. And, uh, for us, just because we had the teams that had this Kanban or agile approaches or like really modern, you know, let's say output oriented management. Those were the ones that were the easiest to transition. So it's good. What in terms of, uh, it, what we did as humanity in the last 50, 60 years in terms of performance management is actually a very good basis for implementation of for the work week or like this as as an umbrella term of like you know changing the perception of what work is right yeah uh, we go from time as a metric of productivity to as you say output mm -hmm. 
uh, your performance is evaluated by the work you do, not how much time it takes you to do it. Exactly. Um, and I think that's if you if you fully believe in that philosophy, then it really doesn't matter actually if your worker gets their work done in twelve hours or forty hours. Um, if ultimately their work is driving business performance. Yeah, I, I fully I, I fully agree on that, uh, and I think that that's why the, I believe that four day work week is also t- some somewhat tied to the COVID, uh, the workplace revolution, the hybrid work revolution, is because modern companies that fully embrace like this hybrid work like hours, um, they can't rely on hours spent. Because you don't have your, you don't have your workers, you don't have your workers in the office. You don't know how many hours they actually did. There's no way you can track time. So you might as well forget about it and focus on like the output. And yeah. I'm guessing that this is a really, really, really good time for an organization to decide, okay, do we want to go like, you know, 40 hours per week, we need to have everybody here in the office so the managers can see them? Or do we say, we don't care about the, 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 the hours, we care about the output? Yeah, and a counterpoint, my, my dad works in an industry where they're paid by time. So overtime exists and compensation for that. It probably exists in one of the last remnants of the workforce where that exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reality is that, you know, I've worked in academia, I've worked in consulting, I've worked in healthcare. I've always worked above and beyond my contracted hours. Mm-hmm. I've never compensated yeah, for yeah. that. So if we're going to say, well, the 40 hour work week is the ideal work week, then you can only give 40 hours of work. Yeah. I mean, and, and that means people should be able to clock off at 40 hours, even if the work is not done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, alternatively, we must go with the alternative hypothesis, which is to say we evaluate output and therefore we need to redesign work in a way that gets people to do the, the, the most output in the most efficient manner for them. Mm-hmm. So here, um, I must say I fully agree with you um, because Modern workforces expect that um, employees take their take the job that they're doing as a part of their life, right? I mean, it's it's something that that is is a, an extension of yourself. In order to perform, you really want you you. It's expected of somebody that you really want to to, to work on that. They really want to. Improve, you really want to achieve something. Um, it's not, we're not counting hours or counting hours is the, the, the furthest away from the truth as possible. Mm. And uh, as a funny, funny thing is, we are, we're at the IT company, right? And we have, we obviously have developers here. We have people designing devices and whatnot, but we also have like a section of production where people uh, build physical devices. We have support, which needs to be available at certain times, you know? And for us, it was about how do we implement four-day work week with with those? And after the first three months, we said, okay, four-day work week is not one day off. It's proper flexibility in terms of your your work, right? Uh, Let's work with that and let's see what works for for teams, how do we change their work approaches, their processes to adapt to that? And the biggest, the biggest revelation for me was support, right? You know, in support, it's really clear. Number of tickets, uh, number of calls, number of, uh, um, what's the, what's the CSAT score, the customer satisfaction score. You, you measure these three and you know how good of, of a support organization you have. And we have a super good uh, support organization. We have, uh, we usually rank like 95% in terms of customer satisfaction. So everybody's happy. So I was really reluctant in implementing this there. You know, 
what will happen? We reduce one day and we said, okay, let's reduce it. Like just cut one day uh, out of their schedules and replace that with a day, which is, uh, which is where they, they are supposed to use that time to self-improve, you know, to perhaps to learn something new about what, what, they're, uh, what they need about their job, grow personally, whatever. So, but for sure, they shouldn't do support. That's the only real, real limitation. And nothing changed, you know. You, it's, it, it's, it's, it's insane that when you start kind of challenging these conceptions, you, you, they're actually misconceptions, right? Uh, and there's, if you push people towards saying, okay, there's a limitation on imposed in the amount of work that you're allowed to do, people, if they're dedicated, um, people find new ways how to get the same amount of work done in the last time. Uh, would that align with your experience as well? Yeah, we call it Parkinson's law. So work will fill the time allocated to it. So if you tell me I have one task and I have from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to do it, I'm going to find stuff to, to you know, fill out my time. Whereas if you tell me I have an hour to do it, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to get the work done in the hour. And that's just simple kind of human psychology that says, oh, I have all this space and I want, you know, I have four other things on my checklist and I'm going to do those all first and I'll come back to this at the end of the workday versus this is actually the priority task and this needs to get done now. And a four day week forces organizations to prioritize work and prioritize work that's going to lead to the bottom line not simply do work for work's sake. Yeah. I think we can start talking about uh, the taboo of work. I, I, I think that we, we've mentioned so, so often in, in the past, uh, in, in this conversation that we need to change the perception of work. What, what does it mean that to work, right? Uh, instead of measuring time, measuring the output. And I found out the hard way that people are not so in, people have a hard time believing in, in this. Like I, I, I was a skeptic and I said, okay, I, I, I'll try it. For some, it's like a religious thing, you know, saying, hey, now you're working just four days. Does that mean that you were slacking before, you know? And um, I wonder what's your perception on the society as a whole? You know, where are we in terms of accepting that it's quite okay or that accepting the fact that in modern, in modern times, you can do the same amount of work in four days or like 20, reducing the, the number of hours spent by 20% and achieve the same. Where does that uh, leave the society or how do you do that? Yeah, I think as a society, we have become serious workaholics. Um, I don't know exactly at what point it happened, probably around the 1980s. The idea of the workers, the work of a person became an intrinsic part of their identity and Therefore, a lot of self-worth of people was put in towards their work. Um, there used to be this idea of, you know, we used to have three places, our home, our work, and our third place, whether it was a, sp a sport or some other engagement, like a volunteering. Gradually, what we've seen over the last 30 to 40 years is the narrative, I don't have enough time. And in fact, it's not that we don't have enough time, it's that we've created a structure of work where it consumes us to feel like we don't have enough time mm -hmm. and therefore we're using our time unwisely. Um, I'm concerned about this mm -hmm. because I think we're now reaching the stage where we're facing the repercussions of that philosophy. Um, we have, you know, I grew up with, with a generation before me that have burned out and they're now in their 50s and 60s and they are completely exhausted, you know. Um, 
I also grew up now in a society where the guarantees of the American dream no longer exist. Yeah. So working hard doesn't guarantee you anything <laughs> anymore. Um, and so I think there's a lot of uncertainty within you know, merge of generations and XV generations as to whether actually this, you know, work hard all of your life is actually something good for us. Um, I was reading a book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, and two of the regrets are, I wish I had lived a life more authentic to myself, and I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And I think we need to look at those wise words of people who've gone through this phase already and say, maybe we need to create a world of work that works for us. Um, no one else is going to do it for us. And I think in fairness to Gen Z, they are forcing organizations to think differently now. Yeah. They're probably the first generation, you know, that grew up with the ability to see multiple perspectives on things because they grew up with technology. They weren't forced into one cultural norm of saying, this is how things are, this is how things ought to happen. They've looked at different cultures and how other cultures have approached life. And as a result, they are forcing leaders in work to create a different type of work now, which will require them to maintain that Gen Z as a, as a human resource. Um, what many leaders don't want to acknowledge is that they rely on the labor of young workers, uh, in order to sustain themselves. So it's, we require leaders to think about how do we keep this new, very different generation engaged in work. And I think gifting people time is how we do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, because Gen Z are looking for something different from the world of work. And we can't necessarily promise them, you know, what we have had in the past in the form of the American dream, but what we can promise them is more time to pursue their own personal passions and, you know, connect with, with family and friends through gifting them more time. I like that you opened up this Gen Z uh, perspective. Um, I believe that you know, when we talk about culture and how people perceive work, there is a big difference between, you know, the old guard and the Gen Z guard. For me, you know, when we talk about the skepticism of, or, or the work became, or the taboos about uh, work, it's, it's funny because listening to Gen Z or like this, it's sometimes you feel like the four day work week is something that came out of the totally woke mind. That's like totally disconnected with the reality, totally disconnected with the business realities. Right. And this cannot make sense. And I totally understand a leader that says, okay, enough is enough. Come on guys. We're here to do work, you know, um, not not to have in terms not not to have fun we're not your family we need output etc etc and you know it's totally a valid position but like like you said credit to gen z or to to this evolution of the the workplace is that i think it we're finally getting to a point where we're we are willing to test this and see that we're wrong leaders are wrong in the sense that this is kind of a perk, uh, something for the well-being of, of the employees and the business doesn't have anything from this, you know. But it's very clear that like the the results of kind of following this modern, let's say, work approaches um, actually helps the business life. This is this is you know it's it's sometimes when you. When I hear myself explaining about four day work week, I, I, I put myself in the others of the other person's shoes and I say, this, this cannot be true. Right. When my, my dad's like, it's a total, he's a total workaholic. He's, he's in, he should be in pension for 10 years, but he's reluctant to give up work. He wants to work, you know, like totally hardcore old school guy. And when, when I speak to him about all of it. It's like, you can see like mind blown, right? And this is like totally woke. What are you doing with the world? Stuff like that. But when I, when I measure 
the results here when I see what how this impacts our business, the bottom line, like as me wearing my co-founder hat, right? No, it's just good business. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, uh, the boomer generation and Gen X, they grew up with management as a, as a discipline. And this is how things have always been done. You dissect, you analyze tasks, and you increase the intensity at work, and you get more out of people, uh, productivity soars. But I think we have reached, you know, the, the, the maximum output of people using that part methodology now. And now we're going the other end where actually people are burning out. We, we also need to look at those generations and say, they had maladaptive work schemes as well. And they have burned out as they've exited the workforce. Many had, you know, reliance on alcohol or other forms of substances just to get by in their world of work, you know. We don't even just have to look at work, but look at the social order uh, around the work and where society has gone as a result of our attitudes to work to realize that we do we do need to do something different with work because we've created this unsustainable world, um, mm-hmm. both in terms of a climate crisis, but in terms of human uh, sustainability as well. So expecting, you know, that old saying, continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different outputs is insanity. That is exactly what we need to do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, and what is what the world of work is crying out for right now is innovation. Mm-hmm. We can't be innovative if we're burned out. Mm-hmm. We can only solve burnout by changing how we work. Yeah. And, and you look at two of the main structures. You think about, you know, when a child is born, they tend to be very creative. They tend to think of solutions, you know, completely outside of, of the box. We put them into a rigid school structure and force them into a certain way of thinking. We might send them off then to higher education where again, they broaden their horizons. They think of different, you know, schools of thought around something. And then we put them into the world of work. We infantilize them and we, you know, make them conform to our ways of working again. We need to break that cycle somehow if we have any hope trying to foster innovation in workplaces. Yeah, and I fully agree uh, with everything you said. I believe that only uh, if you want to have a properly innovative organization um, with the purpose of, you know, with the underlying business purpose of actually producing more, right? Uh, that's That's, Kind of, this is why businesses are, are being built, you know, to, in the end, to produce more for the owners, for the industry, however you want to call it, like totally non altruistic uh, goals. In this, this is one of the, the cases where both really nicely align. So, you know, sometimes, uh, I know if you, if you transition this to politics, this is an idea that's, that's for the work week, that's equally uh, bad for both the right and the left pole, uh, pole, because on the right, you're gonna say people are slackers, now they work just four days. And on the left, they're, they're gonna say, why are the business owners doing this? Aren't they exploiting people, you know? So nobody likes this, except like business owners that are enough forward thinking to say, let's try this out. Let's see what happens. Does this improve my organization in a meaningful way? Uh, and by that, I mean in a meaningful way so that it improves the well being of my employees, which then results you know, in better performance for the company. And you know, that should be, that was our, uh, our thinking behind it. And I really like to distill back always uh, return to, to the, this this point that the fact that we're helping people uh, is is totally aligned with the fact that we're building a good business you know these two here really align yeah I think it's your it's your assumptions about leadership if you assume your staff are lazy and competent and need to be controlled, you're always going to apply those outdated paradigms. You're always going to have mistrust in yourself. Um, 
the workforce is highly intelligent now. We expect so much of them um, with regards to even just getting into a job. And we need to start tapping into that potential. We don't do that at the moment. So we need to assume confidence of our staff. We need to stop thinking that leaders have all the answers. Uh, we need to start instilling that level of leadership across the organization. You might not know as CEO how a 48 weeks going to be implemented in sales or operations. So uh, ask sales and operations, mm. get them to come up with solutions. And I think that trust and psychological safety is what is leading to high performance being built within 48 week organizations. I really like this. Um... This, this let's let's call it the final segment of our, our talk today, because we're really ending on a on a positive note, uh, with kind of the realization that building modern organizations who think about the work from a perspective of not hours being spent, not you know. Um, taking their employees as children, small children, that they need to be managed like for every detail, every hour, minute, second count accounted for, but saying, Hey guys, you're adults. Uh, you need to achieve this, figure it out. Uh, and that could be kind of implementing for day work week, doing your, your, your job, uh, during the day, or just kind of living, you know, and in the end, then living a good life while you're doing that. I think this is kind of, you know, the paramount of uh, what we, we can achieve uh, if more organizations take this or they work we, we, we a bit more ser seriously and think about what, what the, they're actually doing in a day to day uh, and how they're managing the, their, their business and uh, whatnot. Uh, I like that. That's a nice summary. Yeah. So, any closing thoughts uh, you want to add? Yeah, I suppose we didn't really touch on it more that much, but we face many like challenges as a society, and we spend about a third of our lives, if not more, in work. Work acts as a catalyst for us being able to actually address some of those challenges, including issues of environmental, you know, sustainability, issues of equity within our workplaces. So more broadly, the four day week has been found to, you know, help with building more sustainable communities, sustainable environments. It's helped to create more parity between genders in workplaces through rewarding performance as opposed to time. And I think these are bigger questions that as an organization, 40 Week Global will start to look at over the next 12 months is what would a four day world look like? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the economics of a four day, you know, uh, a four day working world? Uh, or what might that look like in, in public, private, not for profit organizations? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we hope to be able to, you know, come back to these sort of conversations in 12 months' time with. And even, you know, fresher perspective on the need for businesses to play more of an intrinsic role in helping to create a more uh, equitable, healthy, sustainable world, which I think is going to be pivotal uh, for the future of us. I, as I think what the best thing about all of this is, you know, instead of being a requirement for, for a top down policy that, uh, where we would need to rely on our governments to implement and that's going to take so much time and you know god knows what's going to happen in the end the still you know, is something that's unrecognizable here we're really talking about change from uh, uh, bottom up you know changing the organizations like you said we spent one third of our time in in this uh in the organizations and the organizations have an incentive to change without, sometimes people ask me, um, I mean, policymakers ask me, hey, uh, would you, what do you think that the, the state should do in regards to the four day work week? And I usually just say, just stay out of our way. 
right? Sure. Just just let us be and start thinking about the public work and how you man manage manage that. So, what's the what are the KPIs? How do you measure performance there? I think that's that's the big and through that through those changes, right? We're gonna get to to a more sustainable world, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. More balanced world as well, and sustainability is our in our DNA. So, um, can't be more help happy for that. Absolutely. Uh, okay, um, I think this concludes our uh, our talk for today, Dale. Thanks for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, um, and I'm really looking forward to what great things you're gonna launch at Four Day uh, Work Initiative. Thank you so much, Luke, and thank you for having me on. And best of luck in the next phase of your Four Day Journey in your organization. Thanks so much.